Hey there, students. We are here for yet another broadcast on our AP Euro Corona class. And I want to uh, wish everyone a happy May 4th. All right. So everybody, may the 4th be with you. I've got on my Star Wars shirt here. Uh, and so with that, uh, now spoil the Clone Wars finale and I'll kill you. Uh, I don't know if I can actually legally do that, but I can kick you out of the chat or something like that. So I've not watched the Clone Wars finale yet. Uh, this is, uh, you know, something, of course, it's been years in the making. Okay, just uh, somebody said that there were muggles present here before we went live on YouTube. We went into, uh, let's see, so um, hey there, Ireland. Good to see you here. Now, remember everybody that uh, the, you know, as far as that goes, um, if you want to join us on Crowdcast, feel free to join us. There is a link there. I'll give y'all a direct link. Okay, so we are we are back. Sorry about that. Somebody said that there are muggles present. I was like, muggles? And uh, then, yeah, so we're back. We're back, y'all. Ask your questions. Get your questions in. Now, also understand that uh, we're going to be talking about 19th century isms. Uh, for those of you who are interested in some more in-depth writing uh, practice, let's make sure that you know about, uh, hey there, James, that you know about my um, Clint, my DBQ clinic here. Um, in the YouTube description, there is a link to my DBQ on conservatism in 19th century Europe. Uh, then we, you know, in the early 19th century, and we're going to be uh, going over this on Saturday. We've got one session here um, that has already been delivered that is available in archive form. And then we've got another session on Saturday. So you definitely want to take a look at that. Uh, but yes, uh, Suzanne, okay, I'm glad to, uh, glad to see you over here. Thank you very much. And so with that, um, let's go ahead and start answering questions and we'll get uh, we'll get started. Yeah, so we'll see if we've got uh, more people joining us as the exam comes closer. I think people aren't quite in exam mode yet. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of people that have signed up, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, right now we're more than a week out from the exam. So not everybody's going to be here with us and that's okay. All right. So as far as that, Mr. Good is asking how, how which of the many revolutions during the early 1800s should we know? Would it benefit to associate them all together as revolting against Metternich's order? Uh, you know, if I were making the call, I would say to pick like, you know, two or three revolutionary movements. Um, so in terms of that, okay, Victoria is here. Thank you, uh, Victoria, for coming and for your support on Instagram and at Tom Ritchie, by the way. So with that, um, which of the many revolutions? So I think to a certain extent, you are choosing this for yourself. But when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking in terms of Greek independence, on um, the 1830 French Revolution. Now, there were some other revolutions in 1830, but I would not worry about like the revolution. I would just worry about the French Revolution of 1830, where you're basically um, getting, you're trading one constitutional monarchy for another is what happens in the French Revolution of 1830. So with that, now another thing we want to note here is when we're thinking about the conservative order, we see the French Revolution of 1830 as a revolt against um, the conservative order in France as far as the Bourbon monarchy. But at the same time, uh, we see then Louis Philippe comes in, who calls himself the Citizen King. Louis Philippe brings back the tricolor, okay? So the House of Orléans um, comes in and is the monarch, and he is, he's got a tricolor flag, but as Louis Philippe continues to be king, um, he is, uh, you know, he's going to be uh, as he continues to be king, he's going to get more conservative, less liberal, more conservative, leading to the French Revolution of 1848. Now, what I would do with, with the revolutions of 1848 is that I would know the basics. OK, so, for example, I've got a five part video series on the revolutions of 1848. The first part of that series goes into the basics. Now, then we see the revolutions of 1848 in France, in Italy, 
in the German states. And then finally, why not Britain and Russia? And speaking of Russia, James, you're asking about the Decemberist revolt. So that's something I think you can have in your pocket. So I would say not more than three. So for me, I would say Greek independence, French Revolution of 1830, French revolutions, French Revolution of 1848. Those would be my big three. Now, substitute any of those. Now, I would say the revolutions of 1848, you want to know um, something about them. But I would say the Decemberists, that's certainly fine. Okay. So anything, the Chartists, that's another thing. Okay. But I, I would make sure that when you're thinking about challenges to the conservative order, I would advise you pick three of them, like pick three of your favorite challenges to the conservative order. And one of the things is, especially when we're looking at a DBQ exam, where you are choosing your own evidence, okay, we can think about you're getting some choice here. And so you pick that. So the age of Metternich, uh, because uh, that's when he died, um, is the age of Metternich 86? What does that mean? Or I don't think he, oh, um, Metternich did not, you're asking about the DBQ. I'll talk about the DBQ in the Saturday session. Make sure that y'all understand, uh, you know, the terms of that. Um, that's going to be a premium session on Saturday where I'll go in depth into this DBQ. I don't want to answer questions about that DBQ because I want people to have time to do it. Okay. I want, I want people to have time to do it. Now, what I'm going to do, let's go ahead and the Google documents seem to be pretty popular. So what we'll do here here is 19th century isms notes. Okay. So 19th century isms notes. And then, so we're going to say here, we're going to start off with challenges to the conservative order. Okay. So let's note that. And we're going to say like pick three. Okay. So we're going to say pick three and let me go ahead and get this link to everybody. I've got to uh, I've got to get in here and let's see. So I want to share the link and anyone can view. All right, I've copied the link. Let me give that to y'all here in Crowdcast. And we will then go over to YouTube and make sure that it's put into the uh, YouTube video description. Okay, so we're going to note here um, that our Google Doc. Okay, so we'll say our Google Doc. Okay, so the Google document used in this session, and we're good there. Okay, so let's go ahead and update that so that people watching later have access to the Google document. So let's go ahead and get into, uh, you know, into the brass tacks of this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and let's go into, uh, you know, and that's the thing, James. I would ne like, I would have to look up the details of the Belgian Revolt. Now, is that in 1830? Um, so that's one of those things that, yeah, it was actually while I was going over something with a client uh, the other day, I was kind of made aware, oh, there are also some 1830 revolts in the Netherlands and Belgium. OK, so but I wouldn't worry about that. All right. So challenges to the cons oh, oops. All right. Challenges to the conservative order. OK, so we want to think about that. And this is, of course, 1815 to 1848. Okay. So when we think about challenges, we think about first of all, all right, we've got Greek independence. Okay. So Greek independence, Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Now, on one hand, we know that the Greeks were motivated. Okay. So the Greeks were motivated by liberalism and nationalism. But then we also can see that. The great powers, the great powers came around to support Greece to a point, okay, to a point. Uh, when we look at the London Protocol of 1830, okay, so, so when we're looking at this, uh, when, when we want to make sure when I say Greek independence, you want to make sure that it's something that is, uh, you know, that it's something that we need to go in depth. When I say no three, it's not name three, but actually go in there and understand what is going on here. So 
what we see here is that the London Protocol, basically now the 1829, I mean, but I typically look at the 1830 because that shows us the amended version here. Okay, so when we look here um, to a point, uh, you know, so when we look at the London Protocol. Okay, so the London Protocol established very limited borders. Okay, so limited borders for the independent Greek nation. And the Greeks accepted a European monarch. Okay, so they, so basically that they did not create a republic. Okay, so when we think about that, depending on how we use it, it's going to be something, and just about all of these are going to be useful to, you know, they're going to be challenges to a point. So depending on what you want to emphasize. So we want to understand that, yes, they were motivated by, by liberalism and nationalism. See the Greek Declaration of Independence. Okay, so see the Greek Declaration of Independence. So Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire. Now, the next thing I would say is you think about the Decembrists. Okay, so the Decembrists revolt. Now, that was, of course, in Russia. That is a possibility. Now, what I'm going to say here is you want to pick three. Okay, so pick challenges to uh, understand in depth. Okay, now I would say maybe pick two or three, depending on your goals. Okay, so pick two or three to understand in depth. That would be what I would recommend here, just depending on whether you're going for a three or going for a five. Um, so when you're looking at that, now the Decembrist revolt in, uh, in Russia, um, what you're dealing with with the Decembrist revolt is that, now why are we not having the spacing there? All right, so formatting, uh, let's see, add space after, okay. So we should be good now. All right, so the Decembrist Revolt, we see here that there were some military officers that questioned the legitimacy, okay, of the uh, of the Russian Tsar, okay? So basically a group, uh, you know, led by military officers, okay, so refused to uh, acknowledge the legitimacy of the Russian Czar. Okay, so basically the Russian Czar. Now, this isn't one of mine that I usually go into. So, you know, I usually don't have those names in front of me. But if we are going to go into the Decembrist Revolt, if that's going to be one of your three, you want to make sure that, you know, we understand like when it happened, um, that it was an uprising. Okay, so this is a protest against his, uh, you know, against his assumption of the throne. Um, so basically, the legitimate, uh, the legitimate czar had removed himself from the, you know, from the succession. Okay, so what had happened there, so this is 1825, Russia, 1825. Okay, so you'd want to know about when it happened. Okay, so legitimacy of the Russian czar preferring his older brother, okay, so his older brother who had refused, okay, so the Russian Tsar, um, we see here Nicholas the first, of course, not Nicholas the second, okay, so referring his older brother Constantine, who had removed, you know, who had decided, who had refused, uh, you know, who had refused to accept, you know, basically, ba basically who had repudiated. I want to not use the exact words there, but yes, uh, you know, Sue, so who repudiated his right, you know, his right to be czar. So basically repudiated his right to succeed. Okay, in the succession. And basically what we want to, uh, you know, what we want to note here is that was put down. Okay, so basically, you know, the revolt was put down decisively. Okay, so it was put down decisively. The revolt is put down decisively um, with the last public execution. Okay, so the last public execution in Russian 
history. Okay, so so we see here that the czar's power. Okay, so the czar's power authority was not challenged again. Okay, so challenged again. Uh, you know, during the at any point. Okay, so at any point in the or you know before. So that would be if you're thinking about the Decemberance, the Decemberist revolt. Okay, so the Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire, we're looking at the 1820s. Okay, so you could look into the Decemberist revolt. That would be one there. Now, uh, you know, three, we could go into um, that is, of course, the French Revolution of 18. 30. Okay. So note or other, other revolution, you know, other revolutionary movements in the Netherlands. Okay. So, so when we see here and Belgium, uh, so those are some things that could be eligible. Okay. So we could use those, but I'm not going to, okay. I think the French revolution of 1830 is something that is, you know, pretty universally um, accessible to people. Okay. So I would say I would pick that one, especially with that great painting by, you know, Delacroix. So when we look uh, at the French revolution of 1830, um, what we're, what we're seeing here. Okay. So what we're seeing here in the French revolution of 1830, um, is that, uh, this was a popular revolt against the bourbon monarchy monarchy. Uh, you know, which was, you know, a constitutional monarchy, which resulted in the fall of the Bourbon dynasty. Okay, so and we could note here uh, the Bourbon monarchy. And so the Bourbon monarchy, that was Charles the 12th. Okay. So I believe, am I, am I getting my Charles is wrong? Uh, there are so many Charles's aren't there. There's Charles the 12th of Sweden. So I could actually be confusing that. Okay. So this is the thing that we're doing here um, of 1830. So note here that not even I know all of the gory details of these things. Okay. So of every one of these things, but we, yes, Charles the 10th. Okay. So we take that off. It was Charles the 12th of Sweden during the the Great Northern War against Peter the Great. Now, that would be an example. If I'd said Charles the 12th, a reader's not going to count off for that. Okay. So if I got my, you know, just put a couple little lines there, as long as you understand what's going on, it's not going to cause you a problem. Okay. So, you know, so basically, um, also known as the July Revolution. Okay, so that's something, you know, this is the kind of thing you want to make sure that you'd be able to um, have a couple of things here that are, let's see, and we want to spell that correctly. Um, just, you know, a couple good content rich sentences that you could throw in there as outside evidence. Okay, so basically resulted in the fall of the Bourbon dynasty um, and, uh, you know, and its replacement. by the House of Orléans, led by, you know, so, you know, by, you know, the House of Orléans, led by Louis Philippe. Gosh, we're getting into, uh, we're getting into French names here. Um, and that's where even I've got to run in there. And, uh, you know, or yeah, at P-H-I-L-I, P P E. That is French for Philip. Okay, so almost I just needed to get a P in there. Okay, so we see here, led by Louis Philippe, the citizen king. Okay, so what we want to note here is that although Louis Philippe uh, began as a you know liberal, you know, and nationalist rule, you know, so basically a liberal and nationalist constitutional monarch. Uh, you know, for example, reinstate, you know, so for, for example, like when we think about this, um, for example, he brought back the tricolor, you know, so basically the revolutionary tricolor flag. Gosh, I tell you what, I'm, I'm the king of typos today. All right. So revolutionary tricolor flag. Um, he became more conservative. 
um, as his reign continued, leading to the French Revolution of 1848. Okay, so of 1848. Now, we also want to note that Eugene Delacroix, Eugene Delacroix's famous painting, Liberty Leading the People, was produced to commemorate the French Revolution of 1848. Uh, Louis Philippe, uh, this is something I was, you know, going over the client who had some really specific knowledge that I was really impressed with, um, that Louis Philippe actually purchased this painting, okay? So Louis Philippe, uh, you know, purchased this painting and displayed it for a time, but later returned it, okay, as he began to see it as a threat. So you see what's going on there. Now, uh, I think that there's an advantage of just with the revolutions of 1848, since we're, th oh, also we want to note, yes, this is the French Revolution that is, uh, you know, the context of Les Mis, okay? So, uh, you know, so this is the Les Mis Revolution. So the thing is, when I say pick two or three, I'm thinking in terms of you want to make sure that these things are, you know, are, are there. Now, another thing we want to note here is when we think about the um, the Bursch and Shafton. OK, so that's another one that we could put in here. Um, I always have to look up how to uh, how to spell this. Let me try this. OK. Ah. I always get something wrong here. Okay. Did you mean Burschenschaften? Yes. Okay. So the Burschenschaften, this would be in, uh, you know, in basically the German Confederation in the 1820s. Okay. So basically the Burschenschaften, uh, these were student fraternities. Okay. So student fraternities at German universities that expressed, that promoted liberal and nationalist ideals, okay? So we wanna note that. And then the Carlsbad decrees, okay? So the Carlsbad decrees, uh, you know, which censored the press in the German Confederation, okay, the German Confederation, uh, was aimed at silencing the voices of the, let's see, of the Burschen. I tell you what, German uh, is uh, quite a language. So that's another one that you could go into this as far as a challenge, okay? And so the French Revolution of, 18, of, 18, of 1830. Now, also, we can think of, uh, you know, that we see something that we haven't seen earlier, we can think of like socialism in general, okay? So that's something that is also rearing its head there is we're seeing socialism, okay? So when we're looking at socialism, um, we can see here first, uh, you know, utopian socialism. Uh, we don't need to necessarily, I would not, I'm, I'm not really somebody who is extremely well versed in utopian socialism. Now, of course, this is something, this is a term applied by Karl Marx. Okay. So, so these were, you know, so this was a term applied by Karl Marx to refer to early socialists who believed, uh, you know, who believed that socialism could be established by a voluntary and cooperative process, okay? So basically, Karl Marx was insulting these people. He's saying that only my socialism is scientific, okay? So Marx is saying that only his socialism is scientific, that other people's socialism, uh, you know, is not. And so he calls it, you, um, you know, so, uh, so utopian, uh, utopian socialism. Uh, so then we get to communism. Okay. So communism or what we would call scientific 
socialism, okay? Um, so that's something that we see here in terms of scientific socialism. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, when we look at the Communist Manifesto um, that Marx and Engels, okay? So Engels, uh, you know, predicted that there would be that following in fully industrialized countries, okay, so fully industrialized countries, which only applied to Britain at that time, okay, so when we see this only applied to Britain at that time, uh, that the working class, okay, so the working class proletariat, okay, so that's what he's calling them, the working class proletariat would rise up like, in a violent revolution against the, uh, you know, the industrial bourgeoisie, okay? So as far as that goes, we see that socialism can be seen as another challenge here. And then, of course, we've got the revolutions of 1848, okay? And I would say that you want to specialize in one of them, okay? You want to think about that. That's why I've got three videos after the first one that go into the specific revolutions of 1848. So with that, we, we want to note that this was a wave a wave of, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, simultaneous simultaneous revolutions in uh, basically, uh, you know, we say that in France, Italy, and the German states, okay, which includes Austria, okay, so we think about that. Uh, you know, a wave of simultaneous revolution, Italy, France, and the German states that challenged the conservative order, okay? So one thing we want to note here is, uh, you know, because the revolutionaries were not, uh, you know, were one, not often united, um, because when we think about this, like, what does a 19th century liberal and a night what do a 19th century liberal and a 19th century socialist have in common next to nothing like 19th century liberals really had more in common with the conservatives seeing that liberals and conservatives are uh you know that they're both dedicated to the uh you know to the preservation of property okay so um okay so as far as that uh you know going into this that, uh, you know, we see here not often united, okay? So, and because conservatives were united, okay? The revolutionary not united and, uh, you know, we see here we're not united and outmaneuvered by more united conservatives, okay? Uh, so, more united conservatives and we want to think about here the concert system, okay? So, this is where the concert system is working um, as well. Uh, these revolutions were short-lived and conservative governments, governments, uh, you know, governments were reestablished in Europe by 1850. OK, so that's something to note here. And then also we would say that there were no revolutions in, uh, you know, in Britain or uh, Russia. OK, so we think about Britain or Russia. And of course, uh, Britain was due to reform and Russia due to repression. OK, so due to repression. Now, one thing you could note here that we could also get into the Chartist, okay? So that would be another one that we could get into here. Um, that is, so the French revolutions of Revolution 1840, I'd also say that we could bring in the Chartist, and that would be in the UK, okay? So that would be in the UK, um, 1830s and 1840s, okay? Now, the Chartists were an example of, uh, you know, the Chartists were an example um, of, you know, was a work, you know, were a, you know, were basically a working class, you know, so basically working class, uh, you know, Englishmen, 
you know, so working class, so working class advocates of what we would call radical democracy. Okay. Uh, so when we think about radical democracy today, we don't think of this as radical because it's like universal suffrage is built into our way of doing things. Okay. So radical democracy where we're thinking of universal suffrage. Okay. So when we're thinking about universal suffrage, uh, you know, pay for members of parliament, etc. I've got a I've got a video on the chartists that you may be interested in looking at. Okay, so universal suffrage, pay for members of parliament, etc. Okay, so when we're looking at that, those, you know, they want universal suffrage. So where we go into uh, where now, so we also want to know a secret ballot, okay, which this is something that's radical at the for the time, um, but now we consider a secret ballot to be the norm, okay, so the Chartists, now what we're going to note here is that the People's Charter, okay, so the People's Charter was never, at, was not acted upon by Parliament in the early 19th century, but so even though it was not acted upon, the parliament passed several reform measures. OK, so when we think about reform measures. That increased democracy, you know, that made England. More democratic. Than it had been. OK, and also improved working conditions. Okay. So basically we would look at the reform act of 1832, which I've got a video on that, that basically increased. So it doubled the size, you know, so doubled the number of men who were eligible to vote. So basically, and got rid of rotten boroughs. Okay, so rotten, got rid of rotten boroughs, uh, which, uh, you know, to, to create, so rotten boroughs to create equal size electoral. Okay, so to create, uh, you know, more equitable electoral districts. Okay, so more um, equitable, e more. More equitable electoral districts. So that's the Reform Act of 1832. And then we can think of things like the, you know, the 10 hour act. Okay, so the 10 hour act, when we look into the 10 hour act, a couple of things here um, that we want to note uh, that it limited the number of hours that could be worked by women and children, okay? Which would indirectly lead to more hours available for men, okay? So when you're thinking about these chartists uh, that, you know, a lot of them were not able before the 10 hour act, uh, you know, get able to get jobs because these jobs were taken by women and children, okay? So when we think about the 10 hour, you know, because you might think about what is the deal about the 10 hour act? OK, so the 10 hour act is something that when we're looking at that, it's making, you know, so that women and children are spending less time. OK, so so we see here, um, let's see, doc, so led to an artificial tariff barriers because it led them um, to object. OK, so basically what they say is the government shouldn't be able to restrict uh, a the should not be able to restrict the terms on which a man might sell his labor. Okay, so the Ten Hour Act. This was 1847, and this is, and this is basically a uh, you know a nickname here. So we see the Factory Act or the Ten Hour Act. Okay, so this is 1847, and so worked by women and children, um, but with no restrictions on the number of hours worked by men, okay? And of course, it says here that it was liberals who objected to putting 
limiting the number of hours that a man can work, okay? Because that's one thing. I mean, you look at me right now, uh, you know, I'm working practically all the time. And, uh, you know, that's something that I'm choosing to do. It's not something I do all year, but it's like I go from one thing to the other. And so if I were limited to 10 hours a day, there'd only be so much that I could that I could do. And that wouldn't go along with my choice. So no revolutions in Britain or Russia. Uh, my advice would be, you know, that, uh, you know, that students should familiarize, should familiarize themselves with one, you know, with, uh, you know, with one uh, region. OK, so basically France, Italy or the German states. OK, so that would be something that I would pick one region if I'm using the revolutions of 1848. So, uh, you know, that was a nice way to kind of start this. That was a popular question that was asked and I was able to, uh, you know, yeah, working nonstop. That's another thing. Yeah. So I was about to, you know what? You got me. You got me, Mark, that uh, I'm going to channel a little more liberalism and I'm going to note here that uh, yeah, I'm going to channel some more liberalism. My neighborhood pool, my privately owned neighborhood pool is still not open. Yeah. So the dictator of South Carolina has still not opened my neighborhood pool. So if any of y'all are wondering about that, I tell you, I'm going to have to like show like a photo of, uh, you know, when my neighborhood pool is opened up here. Um, so as far as that stuff, thank you so much, Izzy, if you're still watching here. I'm so glad to uh, so glad to see that. Do I have a link to all the Google Docs? Uh, no, not necessarily, Ryan. Uh, you know, it's like when people are live, but I am learning how to put the Google Docs in my in my descriptions. OK, so I am getting into that. All right. So so with that, uh, it could get shaky since he has cut. Yeah. So as far as that goes, it looks like, uh, yeah, North Korea, that uh, the meme community is certainly relieved that Kim Jong Un is, in fact, still alive. Uh, the meme community was very, very, uh, you know, apprehensive for a little while. So, I mean, it's definitely, uh, you know, we're definitely glad to have him alive, not as a repressive dictator, but as a valued member of the meme community. All right. So as far as that goes, those are some challenges to the conservative order. Now, how is Romanticism a response to the Industrial Revolution? So let's go ahead and take a note of that. OK, so when we're thinking about the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, that's another thing that's happening when you think about this, that the conservative order, like this is something that's kind of an overarching sort of thing that we, we need to remember here is that the industrial revolution is really kind of responsible for chartism and, uh, you know, and socialism. So the industrial revolution, okay, so we want to note here that if we're seeing this as a challenge to the conservative order, the industrial revolution led to, uh, you know, the pop so basically the population moving from rural areas to cities, okay? And so what you're looking at here is that the conservative order, okay? So, you know, working cities and, you know, to, and to greater prosperity, okay? And to greater prosperity for the bourgeoisie. Okay. So, uh, you know, who tended to, uh, you know, who tended to be involved in urban commerce. Okay. So basically what we look at here is that the conservative order. Okay. So when we look at traditional elites, okay. So the conservative order was built on, you know, was, was built on a foundation of tradition, you know, of a traditional social hierarchy with nobility and gentry being at the top of the social ladder. OK, so basically, as we start to see the economy turning into an economy more based on manufacturing and commerce. OK, so as as economies became based more on agriculture, you know, not on agriculture. Um, let's see, based, based less on agriculture 
and more on manufacturing, investment, and commerce. Uh, you know, this was, you know, the conservative order. Order was, you know, became less relevant. Okay, so, so we think about this like the, the, Romantics. Okay, so when we think about the the the. Okay, so the romantics. So we're thinking about. Oh, oops. Okay, so all right, we got that. All right, so good, good. All right. So as far as that goes, when we think about the industrial revolution, uh, you know that romanticism. Okay, so romanticism was a reaction. Okay, reaction against the industrial revolution. and the principles of the enlightenment, okay? So what we wanna think about is, when we're thinking about the industrial revolution, we wanna think about that this is really a continuation of, uh, you know, of the enlightenment, because when we think about this, okay, so the industrial revolution and romanticism. So when we're talking about uh, the Industrial Revolution, that this was the logical conclusion of Enlightenment ideas, okay, about, uh, you know, science, efficiency, and a laissez-faire economy. OK, so the Enlightenment doesn't care about beauty. OK, the Enlightenment cares about like when we think about this, that classical liberals. OK, so classical liberals were the biggest supporters. OK, so the biggest supporters of industrialization. OK, because it led to overall economic growth and a wider variety of goods available at cheaper prices, okay? So basically this makes sense uh, from an enlightenment lens, okay? But as far as this goes, that romantics, okay? So romantics looked at the ugliness, okay? So the ugliness of the industrial revolution, okay? So the romantics looked at the ugliness of the industrial revolution, which they saw as destroying child, you know, so basically they saw as destroying, uh, you know, destroying beauty and childhood. So, so essentially, so, you know, taking humanity away, okay? So it's removing humanity from its beautiful natural setting, okay? So from its natural um, place in, you know, in the beauty, the midst of the beauty of nature, okay? So when we think about this, that, you know, the industrial revolution is taking us out of there, and this is why romantic art focused on often like landscapes and natural settings, okay? So this is the reason why romantic art focused on landscapes and natural settings, okay? Now, remember the night before the exam, I always do an art of AP Euro um, premium session. So I want y'all to be aware that that is gonna be coming around. That'll be sometime the night before the exam. There will be a free public broadcast um, followed by, uh, you know, followed by um, the art of Euro, and then we'll have like a salon there uh, after that. So so with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue uh, with that. So just to note that that's going to be something that's uh, something that's coming. All right. So then we're thinking here that romantics, okay, did not care about overall economic growth, okay, um, growth, uh, which, uh, which they felt was nothing uh, if most people's lives were, but you know, were less beautiful 
because of it, okay? So if we look at this, people's lives are less beautiful. Romantics are thinking that, you know, it's it's kind of like, it's, it's very interesting that right now, uh, let's do a little poll in the crowd cast, okay? Let's do a little poll in the crowd cast. What I wanna, what I wanna do here is I wanna ask y'all, um, are you ready, you know, with, if, we, if you could go back to school next week, would you? Okay. So if you could go back to school next week, would you? Okay. Yes. No. Okay. Let's see what people are saying here. If you could go back to school next week, would you? Interesting. We've got, okay. So a lot of people are saying yes. Now, what we have here is ro a bit of romanticism because the thing is, what is motivating part of these yeses? 70% of you are saying yes, you would go back to school next week if you could, okay? And so the thing is that when we think about this, what are we typically, you know, when somebody asks, do you want to be in school? Okay. So, you know, we see a few of you say, saying no, but if I could go back to school right now, I would. Okay. And so going with that, okay. So y'all have some strong opinions here. Okay. So, so just thinking about this, that have we romanticized school a little bit? because of what's happened here, right? Uh, and of course, also, I think that I've been guilty of some romanticism in the sense that, you know, I've always wondered like, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just like be on YouTube all the time and I could just, uh, you know, run an internet business and not have to go uh, to work and actually teach on someone else's schedule. And I've realized, you know what, I kind of romanticized the life of a full time like internet teacher slash YouTuber, because when it's uh, when you're thinking about this, uh, you know, I just I'm realizing, you know what? I like being around actual people. OK, I like teaching an actual class of people. Um, so, you know, I don't think that I'm you know, I think a lot of times we probably romanticize the idea of, oh, wouldn't it be great just to be at home all day and not go to school now that that's reality? We don't want to do that. Um, so, so the thing is, understand that this is, uh, you know, this is actually something that, uh, you know, when we think about romanticism, that it's going against the industrial revolution and the enlightenment. Okay. And so when we look at the revolutions, uh, Mark, it's going to depend which revolution. Okay. And then how much uh, liberalism. So no revolution would be like fully liberal, okay? So when we think about this, that, you know, the early revolutions are going to be, you know, liberal and nationalistic. Now, as we go on, we're going to see that the industrial revolution is going to go into, um, you know, you're going to see that that's going to bring in not only liberalism, but you're also going to have, you know, radical democracy and socialism at the same time okay so that's something that is uh you know that is uh that that is important there all right so going on let's see so so yeah when we look at this we want to note that we need to look at the individual revolution and we need to see what's what it's going into now note that the most industrialized country did not have a revolution. Like Britain did not have a revolution in 1848. And remember that was largely because of, uh, you know, of, because of the emphasis on reform by the British parliament, okay? And so as far as that goes, Francis, uh, when we talk about what I call POV plus, POV context, audience, and purpose, um, I'm gonna refer you, Francis, to my AP Euro DBQ page, okay? So if you type in, AP Euro DBQ, um, you will be able to see my DBQ page, uh, you know, should come up. Um, let's see, we've got a, got a few that I need to, uh, to get on there, but the AP Euro DBQ, okay? So that's going to be something I would, I would send you here. I've got a full set of sample responses with notes in the margins, okay? So that is Googleable, just go to Tom Ritchie, AP Euro DBQ, and Google that and you will find uh, my AP Euro DBQ page. And let me post that in the YouTube chat for, um, in the YouTube chat for your convenience. Okay, so gonna put that in the YouTube chat for your convenience. 
And so with that, uh, let's see. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. The air, you know, y'all are noting the background that the, uh, you know, the air, when the air conditioner's on, it kind of like blows into the background so you can see the wood moving. But yeah, some of y'all, it's, it's very, uh, very interesting that some of y'all know a lot about it. So, so with that, um, let's see, what does that mean? I could say, uh, I could say no. Uh, let's see, liberty leading the people. Now, liberty leading the people is not so much liberalism, it's romantic nationalism. So I would say that liberty leading the people is uh, is not an example of enlightenment. It's not an example of liberalism. What you're seeing there is romantic nationalism, not so much liberal nationalism, but you see a flag, you see uh, you know people of all classes participating. Um, there's really nothing inherently liberal about liberty leading the people. Understand that Delacroix was a romantic painter, okay? That that was really his uh, his specialty. Um, let's see, Eugene Delacroix. Okay, so when we're looking at his work, now Delacroix's work was also employed in the, uh, you know, in the service of Greek independence, okay? So you see that there are um, some romantic scenes that he's uh, that he's put out there. Um, so for example, we see like Greece personified as a beautiful woman here. Let me go ahead and just uh, just note this, okay? So this is um, a class, there are some nuances, James, but classical liberals and libertarians, uh, it's, it, they're pretty close in terms of philosophy. So you can see where Delacroix's art had put it been put into the service of Greek independence, where Greece is personified as this beautiful woman. And, uh, you know, then you see this Ottoman. Now, here's the thing that this looks nothing like a Turk, okay? But what you see here is in order to make Greece look more European and the Turks look less European, uh, you know, his purpose here is to uh, arouse, uh, you know, arouse support for the Greek independence movement. And so you can see the Turk, I mean, Greeks and Turks really don't look fundamentally different. Uh, there are, you know, which you can, you can tell maybe to some extent, but there are a lot of Greeks who could pass for Turks, a lot of Turks who could pass for Greeks. Uh, genetically, there's not a whole lot of difference between, uh, you know, between people in the two countries. So with that, you can see an example of how, uh, you know, romantic nationalism is seen not only in Delacroix's work about um, you know, with the Greek independence movement, but also um, his work with the French Revolution of 1840. I mean, 1830, I'm sorry, 1830. All right. Does the French Revolution finally end absolutism? Uh, that I would say for the most part, I mean, France is never going to have another absolute monarchy in the sense that existed um, at the time of the old regime. So even Napoleon, even though Napoleon, you know, wielded dictatorial power, but part of the reason he was able to do that is because he was able, he was, he was catering to the support of the people. He did things that were popular. It's like, you know, he did things like when you think about the Concordat, the Concordat was popular. It was what most French people wanted. It was greeted with a lot of enthusiasm. And Napoleon also said, well, you know what? We're bringing back the Catholic Church, but you can be whatever religion you want. And so that's something that is uh, that is important there. So, yeah, I would say that you never see the same kind of absolutism. So even after the fall of Napoleon with the Bourbon Restoration, that established a constitutional monarchy. OK, so you see where Louis the 18th is brought in, but it is uh, it's constitutional monarchy. The Napoleonic Code, okay, what we want to understand, we're getting into Napoleon here, but oh well. Um, so the Napoleonic Code um, is uh, was a set of laws. Now, first of all, it was a set of laws for all of France, okay? So we want to understand about the Napoleonic Code. It's a set of laws for all of France. For the first time, France has one set of laws that is visible that is accessible to people. It's not like you don't need lawyers anymore, but people actually know what the law is. So, so the law applies to all of France. It superseded all of the previous feudal law codes. And 
It uh, was visible. It was easy to read. People understood what the law was for the first time. And then we think about it recognized the equal equality under the law, at least between social classes. Like one man wasn't in any in any better of a position because of the Napoleonic Code. Now it did have the one place where you do see some, uh, you know, some inequalities is in men and women. The Napoleonic Code has some conservative features. For example, now this is where when we're thinking about absolutism and did that come back and well not really in the old regime like france that was you know the catholic church was the official state religion of france you did not have at that time when catholicism was the official state religion no divorce okay divorce was not possible here now during the reign of terror de-christianization you know what the opposition divorce is catholic let's go all the way back the other way and let's make it to where either a man or a woman can sue for divorce for any reason. OK, so during the reign of terror, women had the right to sue for no fault divorce, just like a man. Now, under the Napoleonic Code, there was divorce, but it was under certain conditions and those were not necessarily equally applicable to men and women. So, for example, a man could sue for divorce from his wife uh, because she had uh, committed adultery. She'd been with another man under any circumstances. He can divorce her for that reason. Now, the woman could only file for divorce if the man had brought a mistress into the house and thus publicly embarrassed her. So what you see here is that double standard where the man, uh, it's understood that he's going to have a mistress or two uh, as long as he keeps it invisible. And then the woman, she's supposed to be faithful to her husband at all costs. So that's something that is uh, that is important there. So with that, uh, you know, that's that's a bit about the Napoleonic Code. Now, socialism and communism. Communism is a form of socialism. OK, so that's important to note that communism is a form of socialism. Socialism is any kind of philosophy. It describes anything that first of all sees individual ambition as contrary to the to the needs of the group, to the best for the group. When we think about liberalism, classical liberalism says that individuals making decisions freely more often than not, that is going to lead to the best result. So when we think about me having a lock on my name, there being a lock on my neighborhood pool put there by order of the dictator of South Carolina, that even though my neighborhood pool is not public, it's being classified that way. Now, that is a socialist kind of endeavor because it's saying that my individual desire to go for a swim, that I can't be trusted to keep a social distance, that there have to be laws that are in place um, in order to, uh, you know, in order to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do for society. Um, whereas, uh, yes, of course, whereas from a liberal perspective, uh, people should be able to do what they want. So Sweden has been probably the most liberal Western nation in dealing with the coronavirus crisis. They have not ordered restaurants or cafes to close. They have told people, you know, they've told citizens, uh, it's your job to practice responsible social distancing. Imagine that. OK, now when we get into socialism, we get into that there needs to there need to be things in place to keep these selfish individuals um, from doing what is going to hurt the group. OK, so. Uh, so, yes, two, I've got two go to analogies. You're absolutely right, Talia. Uh, Revenge of the Sith and uh, Star Wars in my neighborhood pool. All right. One of these days, uh, the dictator of South Carolina is going to open up my neighborhood pool. So what feminism can we glean from the 19th century that could be that would be useful? Now, first of all, I think liberal feminism from Wollstonecraft would be something that would be uh, would, that would be important to note that the earliest feminist movements were inspired by the values of the French Revolution. Um, this is liberal feminism that is wanting women to be seen on, uh, you know, on equal legal terms to have the same access to education 
um, to have the same access to polit to the political public sphere. So we look at uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Olympe de Gouges. Uh, now then in the 19th century, you've got of course the industrial revolution puts a lot of women in factories, uh, puts them, uh, you know, now remember what we want to note about women. Don't ever write that before the industrial revolution, women just stayed at home cooking and cleaning. Um, before the industrial revolution, uh, most people lived in, uh, you know, lived in agricultural rural settings where, you know, the man and the woman worked on the family farm, okay, or worked in, you know, if the husband was a blacksmith. Uh, the wife's got, you know, some way that she's helping out with that, that the family is doing some kind of work uh, together. James, let's not spam the, uh, let's not spam the chat, please. All right. So as far as that goes, you want to note that women are working in factories. Flora Tristan, um, she was a French socialist that is often um, cited. I've seen her cited more than once in DDQs. Um, she was a prolific writer, so you could note uh, you could note that there's so there's a liberal feminism, and then there's a socialist feminism, and then again we'll want to get into the suffrage movement, uh, which could still be fair game. Uh, that is Emmeline Pankhurst. All right, so uh, the mechanical revolution, what are we talking about the mechanical revolution? I'm not sure what we're talking about. Uh, what I think you may be talking about, um, Alex, is, uh, you know, so what I'm thinking is by the mechanical revolution, you're probably thinking of the second industrial revolution of which I've got a video. So just go to YouTube, look for second industrial revolution. All right. So Vicky has got a question here about the triumph of liberalism in Britain, okay? So understand that at first, Britain is just like everyone else with the whole conservative thing. And we've got two things where we can see, and this is where if you look at my reform bill of 1832 video, Vicky, you're going to see that uh, that is, you know, going to be helpful there, that we've got two things. First of all, the... Uh, we're going to think in terms of the Peterloo Massacre, where there was a working class protest and the British government brought in the cavalry. So the Peterloo Massacre is something to note there. And also the Corn Laws. OK, so the Corn Laws were passed and I've got a video on the Corn Laws as well. The Corn Laws were passed. Um, in, uh, you know, in the early 19th century to put an import, uh, basically a tariff, an import tax on grain coming from Europe. And what this did was it protected the price of grain for agricultural uh, entrepreneurs. So when you look at the Corn Laws, it was something that benefited the gentry, okay? It's something that benefited the gentry and, uh, you know, the gentry and the nobility, which the nobility were always a very small group in England. So the gentry is really where the power was um, in the early part of the 19th century. But note that as we go into the Industrial Revolution, okay? So as we get into the Industrial Revolution, what we're seeing here is that we're seeing the rise of the urban industrial bourgeoisie. And so that's something that, uh, you know, is going to challenge on um, the conservative order. And that's where you eventually lead to uh, the repealing uh, of the Corn Laws in the 1840s by Sir Robert Peel, who was basically the leader of the conservative party. So what we're going to start getting into here is um, that you see the Tory party, like the old Tory party falls apart and you see that Robert Peel is, uh, you know, is the leader of the conservative party, which is the party that exists today. And of course you see the liberal party become, you know, you go from having the Tories and the Whigs to the conservatives and the liberals. So in the late 19th century, we're going to see the conservatives and the liberals and the conservative party eventually comes around like where you see the repeal of the corn laws, the conservative party comes around on economic liberalism. So when we look at Britain in the mid to late 19th century, we definitely see like an increase in liberalism and a lot less influence by the traditional gentry. All right. Uh, gosh, the chat is all Harry Potter in the crowd cast. All right. So, uh, so with that, that's, uh, that's interesting. 
Uh, YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Okay, I don't know about that. Let's see if we open that in such view. Um, okay, they're going to expect. Okay, so we've got a, our stream status is all right. Oh gosh, don't, oh no, don't spoil Clone Wars for me, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, it's probably uh, you know about that time. Okay, now Mark, what you want to note about Bismarck? is Bismarck is into what you would call real politic, okay? Real politic is, uh, you know, is getting into rejecting rigid ideologies and basically making alliances, okay? So it's not so much new and old conservatism, uh, Mark, that you're looking at the 2016 AP Euro DDQ, and if you're classifying Bismarck as a new kind of conservatism, it's largely because of real politic. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, you know, we've gone into, let's see, Victoria, as far as mechanical devices, I would pick one or two from each industrial revolution. Okay. So I typically think about like the spinning Jenny and the water frame from the first industrial revolution. Uh, and then I'm thinking about for the second, the internal combustion engine and uh, automobiles, uh, something like that. All right, so going with that, uh, let's uh, let's go into um, just yeah. Just remember that I'll be back on Wednesday. What are we talking about on Wednesday? Um, we are going to get into. I, I'm noting the conservative order, but I might retitle that. Uh, what would be a good broadcast topic for Wednesday's Corona class? Because we actually spent a lot of time talking about the conservative order today. Anybody have some topic ideas? for our Corona class uh, on Wednesday. We will be back at when, on Wednesday at, uh, we'll be back on Wednesday at one o'clock. Okay, so when we think about this stuff, uh, let's see, so unification. Uh, so we'll go into perhaps, you know, that might not be a bad idea to look at the late 19th century, okay? So going from that, I may retitle it, but whatever the title, we are going to be back on Wednesday for uh, what will likely be our final Corona class um, because I'm going to be more than likely broadcasting for AP government um, on Monday, but uh, we w but I will be doing some other things and I'll be keeping y'all apprised of those. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, again, it has been a pleasure just like it always is. And I will look forward to seeing y'all on Wednesday at one o'clock.